G'day guys and welcome to Kel's Gone Bush, the podcast where I'm bringing you the craziest stories, characters and places from Down Under. Today's episode carries on from last week's episode which was about great Aussie survival stories and the first survival story was two mates that got uh, rescued down off the coast of South Australia Tony Higgins and Derek Robinson, and they went basically just a little recap. They picked up a boat on the western part of South Australia, I'm pretty sure, and then they were bringing it back and they got a bit of propeller trouble. They decided to take a different course. They let a mate know, um, and then they went out of range for a couple of days. So the mate raised the alarm with the police, and that sparked a huge search that involved the Air Force and everything and cost around. $650,000 $650,000 according to everyone that's whinging about it on the internet. So anyway, so they were found, they were fine. Um, poor Tony, who bought the boat and was pretty much blamed for everything, copped a lot of shit online and apparently even just from onshore, from the people that were on the jetty yelling at abuse at him, which I don't know how true that is. I just, um, yeah, that was one of the reports. So today... <laughs> Well, actually, last week, just after I uh, published the podcast, I was reading the news and it popped up that Tony Higgins uh, had gone missing again. So I was like, shit, I just posted that story and what a happy ending it was. And nope, he's got into trouble again. So that is what I'm going to cover today and let you know What's happened? Uh, I did put it off for as many days as I could because I was hoping that there would be a happy ending to this story. However, it doesn't look like that's going to be likely. It's been well over seven days now and he has not been found. It was just a few days after his disappearance that a bunch of debris and personal items from the boat washed up to shore near the Murray Mouth in South Australia. This is definitely not a good sign, um, unless he's got into a life jacket somehow, well hopefully he was wearing one, and um, managed to make it to shore, there's really nowhere else he could have gone. As I said in the last episode, that particular bit of ocean, there's nothing between South Australia and Antarctica, so there's no island that he might have washed up on, Um, yeah, it's just... (laughs) There's nothing except for really, really wild ocean. And the weather conditions over that week were absolutely terrible. So even if he was in the ocean, they were probably never going to find him. So the only hope that he is still alive is if he managed to get himself out of trouble. And, I mean, I held on hope for a few days there. I was like, this guy's a tough old bastard. I reckon he's going to wash up. I reckon they're going to find him somewhere. Maybe in the bush somewhere, living off bush tucker, or I don't know. I just he just had that good old Aussie battler attitude, and it's just really a shame that he didn't win this battle with this boat. I mean, he was not giving up on that boat. So after they, I think I said this in the last episode, after they got brought into shore the first time, he wouldn't leave the boat. He he just wanted to make sure it was okay, and I. As I, I think I said it um, in the face, I did a Facebook live or something after my last podcast to update that actually he's not okay. And um, yeah, I said, why, why didn't he get off? He should have just got off the boat and taken it somewhere and made sure it was definitely fixed and all of that sort of stuff. But in that said, I don't actually think it was the condition of the boat. I think it was the condition of the ocean Although the boat was pretty old and may have had a few little problems, probably would have been okay if it was actually in the Murray River, not at the Murray River mouth where it's known as like hectic tides. And yeah, so what exactly happened to lead to this next disaster? Well, it all started on the Tuesday morning, uh, I think last Tuesday, and Tony rang Triple O with a distress call to say that he was his boat was taking water and it was knee deep and he had found himself drifting out to sea. Well, it's thought that he found himself drifting out to sea. According to Mayor Keith Parks, he suggested that Mr. Higgins woke up to find himself drifting out to sea in knee deep water. 
He said, at that stage, there would have been too much water in the boat to start the engine and there was no hope of doing anything other than if he was lucky enough to swim to shore. He said he could have swam to shore and got in the sand dunes and, and sheltered. He said it's a pretty rugged bit of coast and he would have been at the mercy of winds and currents and huge surf. He believes that Tony was caught unaware because he was more, his moorings broke. Uh, as you can tell, I don't know much about boat lingo, so <laughs> if I stumble over a few things, please forgive me. So he was docked at Granite Island after they took him in to find him for not having half of the safety gear he's supposed to have on the boat and blah, 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 and he cracked it and hated everyone and just wanted to get out of there. And uh, anyway, so he was stuck on Granite Island for the night because the the sea was so rough and the Mayor Keith said that there is no way anyone would have headed out into those waters intentionally. Um, even someone like Tony, who gives zero fucks, obviously, <laughs> and, you know, he's like, fuck it, I'm going to do it. He said even he wouldn't have done that, definitely. He said it wouldn't matter what boat you were in, you would not be able to tackle the ocean in those conditions. So it is thought that this time it was a completely unintentional thing. He woke up found himself drifting out to sea, boats taking water. Next thing you know, a few days later, bits and pieces of his boat are washing up on the shore. It doesn't really take a rocket scientist to figure out what happened there. And it's a sad ending to a, a happy story. Well, it was a happy story, you know. These two blokes battled the seas. They won. They, you know, happy ending, except, well, Tony was pissed off and pretty much said while he was grateful for the help, uh, he didn't need it and he actually never put a distress call out, which actually is true. <laughs> it was his friends. He rang his mate and said, oh, I'm going to be a couple of days late. His mate decided to ring the police. They were out of range. They had no idea anyone was looking for them until they got back into range and their phones went berserk because they had all these messages from friends, family and cops. So I can kind of see where he was coming from. But the general public was pissed off uh, because apparently they're all perfect and they would would have done everything differently. I don't know. It was just... It's sad to see all of the comments on Facebook on these articles and it's like, this guy's missing again and he's probably dead, so can you just not? Because his friends and family can see this and it's just... It's awful and you don't know what happened. No one knows what happened, but we've got a pretty good idea that it was an accident, that his boat went adrift. And can you imagine waking up, as I said before, waking up and it's just like, holy shit, I'm dead. Because he would have known he was a boatie for like 30 years. He would have known he was fucked. He would have just been like, there's no way I'm getting out of this one. So I just hope if it did happen, it happened quickly. Not everybody was against Tony Higgins though. Some people actually found him a refreshing change from, I don't know, what you would just call 2020 culture, really. It's like, cancel this, cancel that, can't say this, can't say that. And I'm not saying you should go out and be racist or sexist or whatever, but it's just, this bloke was just, yeah, he reminds me of every bloke over 60 that's Australian and a tradie or... <laughs> um, anyway, so a bloke called David Penbethy, uh, sorry, a journalist from the advertiser wrote an article dedicated a bit of a tribute to Tony in the face of all the hate and the criticism that he's copying online and it's titled I can't help but admire Mr Higgins's professional contempt for authority and I fucking love it he did state this is not intended as an obituary and hopefully will not serve as one but as things currently stand, there appears to be zero chance that 57-year-old Tony Higgins has survived his latest ordeal at sea. He went on to say further down, when news broke of his distress call on Tuesday, I, like every other person I know, was totally dumbfounded that the bloke could be so reckless to have got himself into strife again so quickly after his last misadventure aboard the very same ranchackle craft where he first found trouble. He said, Mr. Higgins has been called every name under the sun after, over the past few days over his decision to head out again in the Margaral, which was the name of Tony's boat, even though people generally qualified their judgmental remarks with the hope that he was actually all right. Then they all go on to say that if he is found alive and well, that he should be handed the bill for this second rescue, if not the first one. Clearly, Mr. Higgins was not a paragon of safety or a stickler for the rules. 
When he was retrieved from the drink a couple of weeks ago, he was fined a thousand bucks for not having a current boat operator license, although he did argue that he had a think professional fisher's license or trawler's license or something along those lines. And for having out of date safety equipment. The article goes on to say that there is nothing to suggest that he necessarily rectified any of those shortcomings before heading out again. Although this is just a speculation, for it is possible that he did not intend to head out that week at all, but his boat broke its moorings overnight on the Monday while he was asleep on board, meaning when he woke on Tuesday, he discovered it was adrift and filling with water, at which point he rang triple zero. Well, it appears we will never know these answers, as wreckage has been found on the Friday just near the Murray Mouth, a day after the search was officially called off. Although it runs contrary to public opinion, I believe that Tony Higgins deserves a qualified tribute for living a life on his own mad terms. In these button-down times, where so many people have nothing better to do than spend half their life trying to regulate or judge the conduct of others, I can't help but admire Mr Higgins's professional contempt for authority and his dogged lack of interest in his own safety. A bloke called Nathan Davies, who also works for the advertiser, managed to get on Higgins's boat without getting his lights punched out. It's a really good read, so I'll link that to the episode notes below so you can go and have a look at that. Uh, but basically, most of what Higgins says in that interview sounds prophetic now. And it is, of course, laden with profanity as befits a bloke who happily posed for photographer Matt Turner dressed in bare feet without a life jacket holding a lit fag on a crumbling boat filled with petrol cans and bourbon. When asked about the critics of his first rescue, Mr Higgins said they can stick it up their ass. They need to get a life and spend a bit less time critiquing people from an armchair. I went and bought a boat. How else was I supposed to get it back? Fly it? People have been punching around the ocean for thousands of years. They never had anyone go out and rescue them and I never expected anyone to look for me. I'm self-sustaining and if I fuck it up, then I have to pay the price. Tony also spoke of his two adult children and partner who have become accustomed to his conduct over the years. He said, to be honest, if I'm not doing something crazy, they'd be asking what the matter was. My son's mother actually posted something on Facebook saying, can everyone support my son after the loss of his father? And he thought, Jesus, I'm cooked already. That was a bit surreal. David went on to quote his colleague, Phil Corey, who reminded him of the great observation about the Australian character by late writer Clive James, namely that Australians like to regard themselves as the descendants of convicts, when in fact we are overwhelmingly descendants of prison guards, which, just an aside, I had no idea. I thought, oh, that's fucked. I don't want to be a descendant of a prison guard. Anyway... As silly as Mr. Higgins might have been, the amount of crap he endured proved James's point that we are a nation that is enthusiastically regulated and in many cases obsessive to the point of being priggish about compliance. There was a bloke in Victoria a couple of weeks ago who proved this point and struck me as infinitely more annoying than Tony Higgins has ever been. In a tweet he deleted after the subject of a reassuring mass pylon, this misery guts had noticed that two children aged under 10 had set up a lemonade stand in his local park. He took photos of them, he actually took photos of other people's kids, and tweeted the photo expressing his dismay that at the height of stage 4 lockdown any parents could be so reckless as to let their kids set up a lemonade stand and urge the council to move them on. That bloke sadly symbolises a certain miserable mindset that permeates our nation, which, as Clive James said, revels under the delusion that is rugged and raffish and freewheeling. As I said, this wasn't meant to be a veil for Tony Higgins, but if it is, good on you, mate, for reminding us that there should be a little bit of Tony Higgins in all of us, even if the lesson came at the ultimate price. So that was the article by David Pemberthy. Sorry, David, if I pronounce your last name wrong. Flippin' shocking. Anyway, I just wanted to read that for you guys because I think out of all the articles I could find on Tony, that really summed up his character and who he was as a person and maybe kind of explains why he did the things he did. I don't think he purposely went to sea to piss people off or cause drama. I mean, he even said if he goes down, he goes down. He, he could live with that. So I think, you know, it's pretty fucking awful if he has drowned, um, 
but at the end of the day, if that's how he wanted to go out, then he went out doing what he loved. And not many people can really say that. Who who really lives a life? Like this guy had lived for 30 years on the ocean and doing what he loved, and that's how he went out. Um, and yeah, that's fucking the depressing end to this episode this week. And I just want to say, um, yeah, if, if for some miracle they're listening, because I, I doubt they'd have heard of my podcast, but if any of his friends or family are listening, I am... Um, my condolences. I really am sorry for your loss. Um, I'm still praying that he's found somewhere like in the bush wearing a fucking leaf skirt and cooking up a kangaroo and he's fine because he seems like that sort of bloke. So yeah, I'm still holding out a little bit of hope. You never know. I mean, it happened before he was found and it could happen again. But Yeah, this uh, episode is for you guys and for Tony and wherever you are, mate. I um, I hope you're having a beer somewhere. As always, thank you so much for listening. Um, I will be back next week or even maybe... No, it's not going to happen this week. It's school holidays. Holy crap, I can't even believe I've got, you know, five minutes to myself to do this one. All I can say is this episode was sponsored by ABC Kids and LCM Bars. So yeah, back next week, I will bring you something a little bit more uplifting. Um, Until then, you can find me on Kel's Gone Bush on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, as I always say at the end of every episode. If you do try and find me on Twitter and talk to me there, I might not get back to you for a while because I don't get Twitter very well. I think I need like a person that knows how to do Twitter to just take over my account. (laughs) They don't have enough characters for me. I like to do a big paragraph. They're like, no, you've gone over your limit. I'm like, oh, this is stupid. I'm going back on Facebook. Anyway, so you can find me there. I also have a book published by Hatchet Australia. It's on their website, or you can just Google Skimpy uh, Outrageous Stories of Crocs, Snakes, and Pulling Bees in the Top End um, by Kelly Arrowsmith, me. And yeah, that's pretty much online everywhere. It's also available on, um, you know, ebooks and Kindle and all of that sort of stuff. So yeah, if you want to give me any feedback or story suggestions or just general chit chat, don't be shy. Hit me up on any of my social media. Um, I'm always up for a good chat, bit of banter. It's always fun. Also, I'm running a competition at the moment on Kel's Gone Bush, the Facebook page. It should be on there as one of the top posts, um, one of the last five or six posts, and I'll reboost it. But anyway, you win a $50 gift voucher to First Choice Liquor. They're not sponsoring this competition. However, they're pretty much sponsoring me getting through these school holidays. And you also can win a, well, as well as the uh, alcohol voucher, you get a copy of my book Skimpy that I just mentioned before. And I'm happy to sign that for you guys or if you want to give it to somebody as a gift, um, whoever you want to give it to. So yeah, if you want to enter that, go on there, just follow the instructions on the post and I will announce those winners on October the 12th. So you guys have a great week. I'll be back next week with more, but until then, Cal has gone bush.